Paul. Welcome to The Outlook with Lisa and Louie. Good to see you, Lisa. Good to see you, Louie. In our last episode with Kim Scott, we learned a lot about radical candor and inclusion. We're gonna be continuing that conversation and then we're gonna follow up with a conversation with some local business leaders. Kim, I just wanna pick up on something you said about managers and people. We no, None of us wanna hurt anybody's feelings, but it's so important to tell people the truth about and give them that proper feedback so they can succeed. So, you know, what, what um, I, I guess, information would you have or advice you would have for, for managers in the workplace when they're giving that feedback to employees, both with disabilities and without disabilities? I think the important thing is to go into the conversation. And again, remember, these are, these are moments of management. These are two minute, really quick conversations that you should be having on a daily, weekly basis uh, with your employees. So remember, you wanna start by soliciting feedback. Don't dish it out before you prove you can take it. And that is gonna make you feel much better. If you're soliciting feedback on a regular basis, it's gonna be much, it, it will, I promise you, be much easier to give it. But also remember that when we talk about feedback, or as I like to call it in the book, guidance, it's praise and criticism. So remember to focus on the good stuff. You don't want to offer a feedback sandwich where, where you're sort of, you say something nice and then you say something critical and then you say something nice. That usually doesn't feel very helpful. Uh, it do doesn't feel very specific or sincere, but you want to make sure that you are giving voice to the things that you appreciate about all the people who you work with and doing that publicly. That allows people to remember that you're noticing the great, <laughs> the great work that they're doing and that it matters. But when it comes time to that, those, those moments where you have to give someone some critical feedback, uh, remember to go into the conversation humbly. Uh, you are not the arbiter of what's good or bad. You may be wrong, that's okay if you're wrong, but you're sort of, I call it candor and not truth, because to me, truth sounds a little bit arrogant. Whereas candor sort of implies, here's how I understand the situation. I also wanna know how you understand the situation. So be humble, state your intention to be helpful. The reason that you're saying this thing is to help the person succeed, not to kick them in the shins or establish dominance or something like that. You want to offer this kind of feedback right away. That's why I talked about having a little bit of slack time in your schedule so that you can pick up the phone and call someone or, or go chat with someone right after the meeting. So you want to do it right away. It has a short half-life. You, you want to do it in person if possible. If not, you want to do it synchronously. Pick up the phone, call the person. Do not send an email. Do not send a text. You need to, because you need to be able to understand how it's landing for the other person and adjust. You want to make sure that you're praising in public, criticizing in private, and you want to make sure you're giving critical feedback and also praise, not about someone's personality, but you want to use context observation result. You know, in the meeting, when you said, um, every third word, it made you sound stupid. It's very different from saying you're stupid. Uh, same thing with you're a genius. In the meeting, when you offered both sides of the argument, it helped win you credibility is very different and more helpful than saying you're a genius. Because if you say to the person, you're a genius, they don't know what to do again. They don't know what to do next. So you want to make sure that you're, you're being specific. You want me to tell you a story about a time when I failed to give feedback? Because this is what helps me, this story. I, I'm all yours. Go ahead. All right. So I had just hired this guy. We'll call him Bob. And I liked Bob a lot. He was smart. He was charming. He was funny. He would do stuff like we were at a manager offsite. We were playing one of those endless get to know you games and everybody was stressed out. And Bob was a guy who had the courage to raise his hand and to say, look, I can tell everybody's stressed out. I know we need to get back to work. I've got a great idea. It'll help us know each other better and it'll be really fast. 
Whatever his idea was, if it was really fast, we were down with it. And so Bob says, let's just go around the table and confess what candy our parents used when potty training us. Really weird, but really fast. And weirder yet, we all remembered. And then for the next 10 months, every, every time there was a tense moment in a meeting, Bob would whip out just the right piece of candy for the right person at the right moment. So we all loved Bob. He brought a little levity to the office. There was one problem with Bob, however. He was doing terrible work. I was so puzzled. I couldn't understand what was going on because he had this great resume, this history of, of accomplishments. And I, I learned much later, actually, the problem was that he was smoking pot in the bathroom uh, every <laughs> every two hours, which maybe explained all that candy that he had all the time. But I didn't know any of that at the time. All I knew is he, was, he would hand stuff into me. There was shame in his eyes. And I would say something to him along the lines of, oh, Bob, this is a great start. You are so awesome. You're so smart. We all love working with you. Maybe you can make it just a little bit better, which of course he never did. So let's pause for a moment. Why did I say something so ruinously empathetic to Bob? Part of it was truly ruinous empathy. I really did like Bob. I really did not want to hurt his feelings. But if I'm honest with myself, there was more than a little dose of manipulative insincerity in there because Bob was popular on the team and he was also kind of a sensitive guy. And I was afraid that if I told him in no uncertain terms that his work wasn't nearly good enough, he might get upset. He might even start to cry. And then everyone would think I was a big you know what. So the part of me that was worried about my reputation as a leader was the manipulative insincerity. The part of me that was worried about Bob's feelings, that was the ruinous empathy. And this goes on for 10 months and eventually the inevitable happens. And I realized that if I don't fire Bob, I'm gonna lose all my best performers because they're frustrated what, by not telling Bob, not only was I not being fair to Bob, I was being unfair to the whole team. Their deliverables are late because his deliverables are late. They're not able to do their best work because they're having to redo Bob's work. And they're sick of it. They're frustrated. They're going to go work at some place where they can do their best work. And so I sat down to have a conversation with Bob that I frankly should have started 10 months previously. And when I finished explaining to him where things stood, he kind of pushed his chair back from the table. He looked me right in the eye and he said, why didn't you tell me? And as that question was going around in my head with no good answer, he said, why didn't anyone tell me? I thought you all cared about me. And now I realize that by just trying to be nice to Bob, I'm firing him, not so nice after all. And that was really, but it was too late to say Bob at this point, because even he agreed he should go. His reputation on the team was just shot. All I could do in the moment was make myself a very solemn promise that I would never make that mistake again. And that I would do everything in my power to help other people avoid making that mistake. Cause it was so painful. It was painful for me. It was much worse for Bob and it was bad for the whole team. And frankly, it was bad for our investors. We weren't getting the kind of, of, uh, of results that we should have been getting. So every time I'm tempted not to give someone feedback, I think of Bob saying to me, why didn't you tell me? That's such a powerful story, Kim. I remember reading that in the book and it just, I think it's one of the things that has made me refer this book to everyone I know. It's, it strikes such a chord. It's so true. So painful. Yeah. And, and Kim, when I was listening to the story, I have to tell you, it really resonated with me and it resonates in workplaces all over North America and probably all over the world because we are all similar people we all you know try not to hurt people but then in the end it does the exact opposite yeah yeah the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions kim what is the intersection between radical candor and inclusion i learned a lot about this shortly after i published radical candor i was at a tech company in san francisco giving a radical candor talk and the ceo of that company 
was had been a colleague of mine for the better part of a decade, a person who I like and respect enormously, and one of too few black women CEOs in tech. And after I finished talking about radical candor, she pulled me aside and she said, Kim, I'm excited about radical candor. I'm, uh, I think it's going to help me build the kind of culture that I want, but I got to tell you, it's much harder for me to roll it out than it is for you. And she explained to me that as soon as she would offer someone even the most compassionate, gentle criticism, she would get slimed with the angry black woman stereotype. And I knew this was true. And as soon as she said it to me, I realized four things at the first at the same time. First was that I had failed to be the kind of colleague that I imagined myself to be. I had failed to be an upstander against that kind of bias in the workplace. In fact, very often I had failed to notice even the extent to which she had to show up unfailingly cheerful and pleasant at every meeting we had been at together. And believe me, she had what to be ticked off about in that period of time, as we all do. So that was number one. The second thing I realized was that I had been in denial about the kinds of things that happened to me as a woman in the workplace. I never wanted to think of myself as a victim. And so I pretended kind of, you know, no, this was not radically candid, but I pretended a whole host of things were not happening to me that were happening to me. But even less than wanting to think of myself as a victim, did I want to think of myself as a perpetrator. And I, so, so the third thing I realized was that I had been even deeper in denial about the times in my career when I had been biased, when when I had bullied someone, when I had when I had not treated people the way that I want to treat people. And then the fourth thing that I realized was that as a leader, even though I wanted and intended to create these equitable working environments, I had often failed to do so. And so I always believe when you're when you're looking at a really hard problem, you want to break it down into its component parts. And so in my next book, Just Work, that 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 moment right after, yes, there it is. Thank you. There it right is. After, Love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Me too. It, it was really it was a hard book to write, but a but a healing book to write. So I hope it'll be a healing book to read. But I realized that that very often I conflated. I had conflated in my in my life and in my career three very different things: bias, prejudice, and bullying. So bias is not meaning it. It's kind of a it's unconscious and it's kind of a brain hiccup. Whereas prejudice is a very consciously held belief, uh, usually reflecting some kind of stereotype. And bullying is just being mean. So it, it really helped me to begin to think about those three attitudes and behaviors as three separate things. As, as Kimberly Crenshaw said, if you, if you can't name it, you can't fix it. And so I tried to break it down. And one of the things that I realized was that very often people give what they think is radical candor, but what is actually bias, prejudice, or bullying. And so a big part of what I tried to do in the book is to help us learn how we can begin to accept feedback when we've indulged in those behaviors. Because that, I mean, it's one thing to hear feedback about saying, I'm too much or having spinach in your teeth, but to get feedback that you've said or done something that's biased, that feels a lot more threatening. So how can we learn to move through that shame and accept that feedback and also, how can we learn to overcome what David Thomas calls protective hesitation and to give that feedback? Because it's, that, is, that is some really difficult feedback to give. Well, Kim, I, I just want to thank you just for sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful information you've shared with our audience. Uh, uh, you've given them much to think about. You know, and, 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 you know, how they act and interact with colleagues in the workplace, whether they're co-workers, whether they're, they're, they're managers. You know, and I have to think, too, this is probably really good for relationships. Am I correct? Yes, it works at home. It's, in fact, I wrote a whole novel called Virtual Love about how what I was learning about relationships at work got me out of a bad romance and into a happy marriage. I appreciate it. And I love that you've given us two great tools to use 
particularly in our field with the um, disability and employment. I think that there's so much practical advice, how to implement it, not only ideas, but how to implement. So thank you for joining us. And we will be talking to people about this tool and, and, and you know, helping them manage their way in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Looking to find talent? Let us help. Seize the opportunity to advance your business. Check out discoverability.network and sign up today.